What's up, people? It is Keenan bringing you the word, episode 11. I am excited, as always. I am always excited. I realize I said it's every show, but it's no bullshit because I have too much fun. So this is no different today. Kiki, welcome. Thank you. Are we going to have a good show today? It's going to be awesome. We've been talking with um, Sales Stack, which is a group out there, and they're actually having an event later this evening as well, and sales development reps is a hot topic, I would say, today in general. So, um, yeah, we've got some excellent guests for you today. Yes, yes. Well stated. Sales development reps are super hot. It's a big space. There's money to be saved. There's money to be made. So this is a very timely and exciting show. So I'm down with it. It's also going to be interesting because I am fucking tired. Oh, my God. So those of you who follow me on Twitter and my Facebook friends, you already know that uh, I have been on a whirlwind tour in the last 72 hours or whatever. I can't do the math. I did it on my phone, though, and I've had 11 hours sleep in total since Monday morning at 7 a.m. So oh. I am tired. That is faux show. So, oh, hey, my daughter just decided to interrupt. So I might as well put her on the scene and embarrass the heck out of her. This is my oldest daughter, Kenna. And she didn't make the show when we did the uh, She Sell show because she was with her mom. So say hi. So hi. Kenna's my oldest and my strongest. She's got a real strong personality. So um, thanks, baby. I love you. Do you need something? Oh, no, I was just going to ask you if I can um, get some challenge from the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, yes, my daughters rock. I love my girls, and so I will never apologize for interrupting you getting involved. Uh, girl power. Love them. Big life lesson. One of these days, you don't have a beer with me. I'll talk to you about what I've learned by having three girls when I was a hard-driving, football-playing, fighting, guys rule kind of guy, and I expected to have three of those, and we were going to conquer the world, and I got three daughters. So it was a, an interesting experience going through life, learning to readjust but uh, anyway, so um, with that said, Kiki, what are we what are we doing? What what are we gonna do to have this fun? Because I'm all over the place. You're gonna have to reel me in. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot talk. So um, as always, this is an open discussion. The more that we get participation from the Twitters, from Meerkat, thanks for reminding myself, Kira. Um, Please, please, please get your questions answered by by some of the best, Ken Krog and Trish. Okay, so Daddy is being challenged today. Now my youngest just came up and she's crying. What's wrong, babe? What's wrong? My dog got good. What happened? What happened? My dog got good on the door. You cut your toe on the door? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let me see. And the boys oh, yeah. wake up oh. my ward. Okay. Oh, ooh, that, ooh, that looks like an owl. Okay, tell you what, you go see Nicole, okay, and she'll help you out, okay? All right, I'm sorry. I don't know where she is. Okay, she's in the last conference, okay? Can you go find her? All right, I know it hurts. I know, I know, I know. My daddy can't leave right now, okay? So you run down and Nicole will help you out, okay? Give me a kiss. I love you, good. She'll take care of you. Sorry, baby, okay? All right, wow. We've got a heck of a morning. All right, all right, all right. He so. is all things. He is all things. Um, all things to many people. So, yes, sales jolt. Hashtag sales jolt. Get your questions answered. Um, comments, funny comments, whatever you have, throw them at us. Yes, yes. Let's see some conversation here. Let's get some talk going. I want some chatter, people. I want some chatter. Sales jolt. Let's have it. Let's have it. This is too good of a conversation. Um, also, subscribe. So this thing drops to YouTube every time the show's over within like five minutes. You can see all the past shows. And so there's some good learnings in here. And because of the popular demand, we put this in a podcast now. So now you can subscribe to the podcast. And so you can listen in your car. You can listen on your run. You can listen before you go to bed. You can listen in the shower. No excuse not to hear and be absorbed by the wisdom of the word. Mm -hmm. So subscribe, subscribe. And you can subscribe on 
to our YouTube channel because we're dropping crazy videos. For you, for those of you who have been following me lately, I made a big transition. I'm still blogging, but not every day, it, not as often as I did because now we're doing a lot more videos. So jump in at YouTube as well. Okay, so commercials are over. <laughs> uh, anything I miss? Did I miss anything today, Keith? Um, nope. We got it. We got it. All right. Red Bull, if you're watching, you need to start sending me free Red Bulls. I drink them too much. I promote them too much. You guys need to get with the program and hook a brother up. So with that said, then, we always kick off the show with some funny, interesting visual, video, etc. Today is no different, Keek, so do we have a good one today? We sure do. We have a bit of a parody for you today. Um, so I don't want to give it away. Just enjoy. The Taken Inside Sales. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you have any sales. I don't know if you have any coupons. But what I do have is a very particular app on my phone. An app backed by 30 years experience. An app that connects your business to the military. If you sign up with saluting.org right now, it won't be the end of it. You're going to gain loyal customers from the military. It will increase your traffic. They will pursue you. But if you don't, they won't find you. You will lose customers. You will lose customers. <laughs> I, I like that, right? You will lose customers. My favorite, I, I don't know how many people picked up on it, my favorite part was, I have an app with 30 years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I got an app like that. Totally. Totally, I got an app like that. I got four or five apps with 10, 15 years of experience, and we were way ahead of the curve. We just didn't tell anybody yet. Okay. We knew this was coming, right, Keith? We knew all this was coming. We had all these apps built already. We just threw them out now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right, right. Sales development people can be funny because they will. They'll, they'll say things like, oh, my gosh, if you don't buy this, you're going to lose customers. You're going to fall behind. They use that fear, that, that fear, uncertainty, and doubt business, right? Absolutely. Got it. Yes. But, um, I know. I mean, actually, when I was learning about different sales techniques, fear was one of them. <laughs> Who taught you that? Who taught you about fear as a sales technique? Should I name drop my past company? You can look on LinkedIn, people. <laughs> All right. We'll be nice. We'll be nice. That's just silly. Fear is a sales tactic. That's just that's manipulation. That it, it is. Um, it was, I mean, it's finance, so you can play on fear a lot. Ooh, when it comes to money, people are already afraid. Why even why even push the button further? Jeez, I mean that's right. like kerosene to a fire. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I don't know. All right, so we got we might as well bring our guests in. No more of us pontificating and talking about me because I'm doing a crappy job of it today. <laughs> so with that, we have two solid, solid guests. If you are building an inside sales team or sales development team, if you are leveraging the power of sales development uh, structure as opposed to uh, outside structure or a traditional account executive structure, these two people are essential to helping you get there. So if you don't follow them now on Twitter, if you don't follow them on LinkedIn, if you don't know who they are, you, know, you need to know who they are. So in no particular order, but probably because I'm partial to her beauty, we will start with Trish Bertuzzi. Trish is the CEO of the Bridge Group. She is a genius. She is funny. She is from Boston, which makes it even that much better. So please welcome my girl TB, Trish Bertuzzi. What's up, Trish? You got to take yourself on, off mute. So she is not technologically advanced. She just knows all about inside sales. <laughs> and while she figures that out, how about that? You got oh, it. you did it! Hey, smarter than I look. Smarter than I look. What can I tell you? Uh, yeah. So, so I want to tell you, I am not exhausted. I feel awesome, but after watching you for the last 10 minutes, now I am exhausted. I was doing good, and now you put me off. 
I'm gonna have to rebound, rebound. I'm gonna have to talk to Ken to get my juices flowing. Yes, all right, let's get Ken on. So the our other guest is the one and only Papa Bear, Ken Krogh. Ken is a big teddy bear. He is Ken is one of the nicest people I've ever met. He's that type of person when you meet him for the first time. You just want to hug him. He makes you feel like everything's going to be okay and that you don't want to leave his presence because it's not a safe world out there, but if you're around Ken, you feel safe. <laughs> and the guy knows his business when it comes to inside sales and selling. He's a data mine in his head. I'm excited. Ken, welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you. It's good, ex uh, good to be here. I'm hoping I've uh, pushed the right button. Have I done that? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Loud and clear, Papa Bear. <laughs> All right. I'm in, baby. <laughs> so, guys, thank you for coming. Hey, look at this. Holla. Got the colors on that. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Holla, you're looking good. I walked the shirt last time, so <laughs> help me fix it. <laughs> you're looking good. You're looking good. You, people are going to want that, so you're going to have to put it on lockdown. Yes. I've already had three people today. See? I love it. I love it. Um, all right, so guys, let's jump in. Let's jump in because I know, Ken, you actually have a hard stop at 11.45, right? I do, I do. Okay, and this show is traditionally supposed to be 42 minutes, 4-1-1. So let's see if we can keep it that. Lately, they've been running longer. People get excited. We're having fun, but maybe we can keep this one to 42. So with that, why don't each of you take a second? I'll start with you, Ken. Tell me, what is your viewpoint of where we are on uh, sales development world and what do you think is most important for a, someone leading that group to know and be focused on today? You know, uh, the sales development world is the hot spot of inside sales. Uh, it, it's where we have our biggest lift for clients it, it, it's, because it's all about the leads. And that's the key. Uh, there's two versions of, of, of sales development. There's responding to leads and there's cold calling or through lists. And of the two, I choose leads every day. <laughs> So uh, it, it's it's really powerful. It's where it's where the gold is, and um, I think that's where the growth is for the next little bit here. Is is this is this area? It's the hot spot. Yeah, I think you're right, Trish. What are your thoughts? Well, I've been in sales development my whole life, right? So obviously, I I'm partial. I mean, I I still consider myself a sales development rep. So I think it's come a long way. The spotlight is definitely shining on that particular function nowadays. I think Aaron Ross of Predictable Revenue was the one that held up the light, even though sales development had been around forever. He kind of held the light on role specialization. And I think a lot of companies are building their entire sales strategy around selling into that space. But I think it's going to get interesting. Because Aaron yesterday, Ross is a guest. Ooh, what happened yesterday? What happened? Spotify put out a blog that said they did away with sales development, that they think the handoff between that function and sales is not best for the buyer. And so I'm going to talk to them. I think it's kind of interesting. I want to hear their viewpoint, even though I'm writing a book on how to build a sales development team and I'm all about it. You know, there's everybody gets a viewpoint and I want to keep learning. Ooh, okay, this will be a good conversation. Um, Aaron Ross, Ross was a guest on this show, and he was an interesting yes. guest. That guy is so He has way more butter. kids than you have. I know. I know he does. I mean, way more. Seven and counting. I mean, that guy, oof, I love our guests. There's something, I don't know what it is, but some about our guests that just have something special about them, that, and he's one of them. Ken, what's up, buddy? I got five. <laughs> Whoa! Seven, oh, five, I have one, eight. but he's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, so interesting. So before we go there, talk to me. We all—I should say we all know. It. It's easy to pontificate about the pluses. So because I want to talk about the Spotify thing, it's—it's it's in the news. I hadn't heard about it. Ken, had you heard about it? No, I hadn't. So I want to get there. That'll be an interesting, quick freestyle. But with that said, results. What is the downside? What's the negative side? What what? Okay, that's it's all great. It works. What's the crappy side? What should we be worried about? Or what isn't the panacea about inside sales development? Trish. So okay, thanks, Ken. So I think here's the challenge. Because it's such an emerging trend, everybody's hiring those people. So there aren't any more. They're just aren't anymore. So experience went from two to three years, now first job out of college. 
So I get a lot of horrific phone calls from sales development reps that are poorly trained, have no idea what business I'm in, barely know what business they're in, and they're just dialing and praying to God someone has a conversation with them. So the downside is you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, and some of our first impressions are horrific. Wow, Ken? You know, uh, the, the downside that I see is, is twofold. What, what Spotify seems to be saying is the, the handoff between the SDR rep and the closer, they lose information, they lose relationship, they lose context. So, and and that, that's critical. If you're going to have a specialist model with, with two specialties, you've got to make sure that the handoff's perfect, and that's really, really hard to do. And the problem then is there's also delay. So when you, I mean, we have this specialist position designed to make us better at what we do in one specialty, but then when we hand it over, we lose, we lose a lot of it in the handoff and in the delay. Delay and decay is, is the real problem with the specialist model. It's like running that relay race with four really fast runners. If you drop the baton, it's over. Delay and decay. That's a good The double D's. Like the yes. double D's from Ken Krogh. Delay and decay. I love it. So here's the yep. so here's an interesting one, right? Is it? It seems to me, and, and I do this a lot with my clients. It seems to me that Spotify's post, without reading it, but going on what you said, Trish, is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They couldn't figure out how to build processes and methodologies that solve the problem, so they just said, "Screw it, we're not going to do it." That doesn't seem to make sense. Do you agree? Well, of course, because they're not my client. So, of course, I agree. If they had been my client, the issue would have been resolved, and they would have been using InsideSales.com to boot. Hey, yeah. Holla. And, and <laughs> for just a second, you know, the American fighter pilots are the, some of the best in the world because they're really, really good at circling back and doing a debrief when when something happens. And that's really the, the, the missing ingredient is you've got to be good at transferring information then the, the closer's got to circle back every so often and make sure that information is getting transferred. It's a two-way street here. And that's the discipline. That's the process you talked about. Uh, it, it's all about good handoff and then circling back and making sure that the process is in place to ensure future handoffs and, and that it's really working well. It can be done. And it can be done really, really well. So like you said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. People who are using the model and doing it right are killing it. So what do you recommend? So let's just say Spotify calls you up or someone's reading Spotify's thing and they're about to follow their lead. What do you recommend to Spotify? How do you respond to that? I'll, you know, I'll I don't want to make more of it than it was. You know, I, 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 the blog came out yesterday. I read it yesterday. I don't want to, you know, hold, you know, shine too big a light on Spotify, but... Um, yes, let's. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear what Ken has to say. You know, the, the research is really clear. Uh, Dr. James Oldroyd with Kellogg did a research study comparing the specialist model with the SDR and the closer versus the generalist model that Spotify is going back to. And the generalist model has seven point higher close ratio. That's not 7%, that's seven points on average. So if the close ratio is 10%, a specialist model with an SDR is 17%, you guys. That's killing it. But we've got to make up for the problems. It's like we had an assembly line with Henry Ford with specialists along the way, and they're wanting to go back to try and making a car by hand. And, and, and one generalist is not going to be good at the quantity and the quality, and the personality types are not the same. I've got some fun things to show us here in just a minute. The personality types between the SDR world and the closers, they're very, very different. I like that. I yeah, like that. I yeah, and I think, Ken, you, you hit the nail on the head. So the, the challenge with the blended model always was that the rep went to their comfort zone. So if they had an SDR personality, they did that part of the job well and failed to ask the hard questions around closing. Or if they had the closing personality, they would chase any deal, even bad deals, so they didn't have to prospect. That was always the challenge with the generalist model. You can't have a foot in both camps. Uh, so. yeah. Good point. Good point. All right. So, if you're listening, sound. Wait, who was not sound? Who was, wasn't SoundCloud? Who was it? Spotify. If you're listening, to Spotify. You need to call Trish. 
She'll take care of you. You need to call Trish. No. She can save you some money I, and time. That's I'm all fascinated. I'd love to talk to them. I'm fascinated. I'd love yes. to learn from them and see what, what that about. And they should learn from you. We should that, right have a little powwow. So Spotify, pay attention. Give our girl Trish a shout out. Um, <laughs> and all my peeps out there in the sales job world, start tweeting this, right? Let's see. Let's see if we can get the social media world to work. And let's see if we can get Trish Bertuzzi in the Bridge Group connected to Spotify to talk about this, whether it's a follow-on blog post, whether it's an on Twitter line chat or something. Let's get them connected. Let's see what we got. Come on. I'm challenging you. Woo! Boom. Woo All right. So with that said, I'm going to steer us a little differently. And, I, and Ken, I for sure want to get us stuff, uh, the stuff you were talking about in. But if I am uh, a VP of sales and I'm working in, a, in building a sales development group and structure or I'm managing one, right, what are some of the things I should be thinking about? Let's talk about who should I hire. Who should I be looking to hire? You just said, Trish, there's no one left. Well, I still got to build this team. I can't go to my you know, CRO or I can't go to the CEO and say, oh, there's no one left, so we can't do it. What do I do? Who do I hire? What do I do? Well, I mean, I think what, what people have resorted to is hiring first, first job out of college. So when I said there's nobody left, the experienced people are getting passed around, you know, in whatever geography they live in, and every time they make a move, they make more money. They're doing incredibly well. But if you're looking to build a team from scratch, in all likelihood, you're going to hire first job out of college. Okay. So you better be prepared for all the nuances of that. Okay, Ken, what do you think? Well, I, I'm totally in with Trish. We're finding the same thing. So if you're hiring first job out of college, better hire a really, really experienced trainer who knows the coaching model, not just the teaching model. Someone who can, you know, hold their hand and, and walk them down the field for a couple of straight months and help them figure it out. I'm an old football coach, and, and man, there's, no, there's a big difference between coaching and teaching. And, and teaching teaches you what you need to know, but coaching you teaches what you need to do. And, and, and that's the big weakness. I mean, Trish nailed it around the head. It's been hiring now. It's onboarding and training. They've got to understand why they're doing it, what they're doing, and how to do it. And right after the coach, you've got to have a scrappy sales manager. That's the key, someone who will mentor and keep these people engaged because they're brand new. This is their first time. And the good news is, since they're brand new, it's a blank slate, and you'll teach them right, and they'll do it good right from the beginning. Our BD reps, we call them business development reps because they do several different functions, but they actually grow faster by far than the sales reps that we hire. And now some of our best sales reps in small and mid-market came from the SDR world because they're used to, if you can prospect, man, you can do anything. You can figure out how to close. So mm -hmm. grow those people and invest in the specialist positions that support those, those newbies coming on, and they'll do great. And then make sure they know how to play, you know, how to gamify and make it fun so that they can target those millennials. <laughs> So if I'm, so I like this, and, and this isn't necessarily where the place I would go, but I think it's really important. If I had to create a ratio or a uh, a budget ratio or something, how do I know what type of ratio do I need between training and coaching versus the size of my team? Is it one trainer, one coach? Is it a trainer and coach for every five, seven, ten? Is it something I put in my managers so I teach them how to train and coach? How do how do I do that? Let's go a little deeper. Talk about an execution. What do you see out there, Trish? Okay, so, well, I mean, we did research on that topic with Voresight a couple years ago. It's called the State of Sales Management. And what we researched was we, we used the um, Net Promoter Score, and we surveyed, I think it was 1,800 sales reps and sales managers. And what we found was the people that gave the best scores were the people that got three to five hours of individualized coaching every month. So that's the magic number. It's Say that three again. to five hours. Three to five hours of individualized coaching every month. A month? That's not a week. A month. What you need to do with your reps. A month. Eat, which right? Doesn't sound like a lot, but the team gets big enough and it is a lot. What happens is that managers are pulled in a million different directions and that coaching slips to the bottom of the list every time. And that's what we're seeing as a problem. And Ken, I think your organization has addressed that problem very specifically. Yeah, we, we, we specialize in our management team. So we have one manager for about every six to eight reps. 
and we have one coach for about every two to three teams. So one coach about every 20 some on reps. And because it's just a numbers game, if you need that one hour a week or three to five a month, you've got to, and, but, but here's the thing. It's not an hour of just co personal coaching. That coach has had to spend an hour listening to the calls of that rep so they know what to coach on. So there's, there's a lot of work that goes into that. But, but if you can systemize the recording and, and then find the best methodologies for bringing the good calls to the surface, you can save a lot of time and labor costs with the coach. But they've got to be listening to the calls. That's the key. Talk to me a little bit about this coaching role. Is this a role separate from the sales manager or the SDR manager and separate from the uh, sales director, or is it or is it part of it? Is it a separate role within the organization? Well, we've, we've made it separate. I mean, we, what we, but they work closely with uh, like one coach for every three uh, teams that are managed by managers. And so they work, and their job, I mean, I mean think about it. I'm an old football coach. You know, you've got your defensive coach. You've got your offensive coach. You got your strength coach, and that's what this is. This is the strength coach who's sitting in there watching the stance, watching the blocking and tackling, and making sure that those people are getting the attention that they need. The problem with having the coach be the manager is the manager is is really focused on performance management and on the heart and the mind, whereas the the the, the strength coach is focused on the skill. And and those and are I good. love that. It's the first thing I thought of when you started talking about this coach. I started thinking about this idea of all the different coaches, you know, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, line coach, linebacker coach, and it talks about the specializ specialization of each of those. Dude, this is this is fascinating. Do you have any any numbers or any any more data that you can give us around this? Because I'm thinking this is transferable to a whole bunch of things, not just SDR reps. Well, it really is. I mean, if specialization works at the rep level, it works at the management level, and and and, and it's funny because even <laughs> Even personality types are different for managers versus coaches. Coaches are very more, res very much more responsive. Managers are very much more assertive, and they help provide that backbone, that willpower to go hit their goals every month. And um, what we have found is that skills training itself will make a lift about 22 percent, and just following the CRM system, for example, will lift 17 percent. Gamifying, which Rolls into performance management will lift sales eight to twelve percent, but the big news is it increases utilization of the system over fifty percent. So there's a lot of moving parts there. And again, if specialization works at the front lines, it works at management. I'm digging this. So uh, what about the idea of return? <laughs> I'm already anticipating that uh, companies say, well, you know, that's that's overhead, right? I can't, I'm not going to pay. I, I don't know what you pay, but I'm figuring anywhere between sixty and hundred k. I'm not going to pay seventy five thousand dollars for six coaches or nine coaches to run around and coach. That's the salesperson's job. Uh, do you have data or anything you share with people? Say that it's worth the investment because you can see it already coming. Oh, ab absolutely. I, I mean, uh, imagine you know a hundred reps with a twenty two percent lift. That's what you get out of the coach. And it's really back to testing if. If a, uh, a manager was managing five people before, have them manage eight. If the manager is a generalist who's doing coaching and management, they can handle five. But if you split off that coach, they can handle eight to ten, and, and that's the model. And they get better at what they do, which is pretty cool because then, I mean, the manager has to, you know, use the carrot and the stick, but the coach is, is purely on the side of that rep, and we incent the coaches to lift the quality the skills interaction of the reps, we, we incent the managers to lift the productivity, the end result of, of the rep. And so you can even align the pay plans so that they're paid to do what they do. I mean, I'm sure a strength coach's job is to make the people strong. <laughs> so here's a thought. So. You know, yeah. Most companies don't have the viewpoint that the coach should be a separate and distinct role. Most people try to roll it into the sales management role, which is too bad because not only do we not teach people how to be a good sales manager, we don't spend one second teaching them how to coach. So shame on us, right, as executive teams. Yeah. So one of the things an organization can do is if you want to figure out what your ROI is, Ken said the baseline is 22%. Bring in an outside coach, and there are gazillions out there. Hello, we're one. We're one of many. Bring in an outside coach. Put together a pilot program for 90 days, one quarter or two quarters. View your lift. If you get that 22%, hell yeah, go out and hire a full-time person. But, you know, 
We're not, we don't think that way. We never think investment. No one wants to invest. They just want to put something in the bottom, bottom, you know, top, and have something pop out the other end. Sometimes you need to invest in your success, and that's what coaching is all about. I love it. Perfect. Killed it. All right. So if we got all this coaching, then if I were to move this along, it seems to me then, then, as you referenced earlier, Ken, then we should be building and creating some really good salespeople. So should the role of an SBR, SDR, be a career path? Is there a career pathing in this? Oh, absolutely. In fact. You know, the farm league concept, we love it. Although we have found that the really good uh, SDRs have a little bit different structure, about half of them, than, than the closers. And so and some of them just want to stay put. They're, they're not really interested in, in the back end of the sale. They want to be on the front of the sale. And I, I, I love prospecting. That's one of my favorite things. And, 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 you know, working through all the details at the back, and they let somebody else handle that. So it opens a little bit different, you know, but I'm more expressive. And it's the dominant factor that usually drives the closers. So we're finding that uh, the career path is great, but be aware that not everybody who's a great SDR rep is going to be a great closer and vice versa. Trish? Yeah. So it's I'm glad you asked because I just finished this section um, in the book. And I think people make a mistake. When you, when you hire a kid out of college, you know, not that they're a kid at 22, but they don't know what they want to be when they grow up, and the reason they took a job with you is probably because their friend told them to, or you offer beer, or I don't know, something crazy, right? Or you're the only company around, I don't know, whatever the reason. So I think what we do is we make a mistake assuming, assuming that their career path has to be linear within our organization, that they're going to want to go from prospect to closer. So what we tell our clients is, look, you need to have professional development conversations with your SDRs and you need to say to them, you have a degree in finance, would you like to explore that opportunity here? Or have you thought about marketing? Or have you had a thought about customer success or account management? Thinking linear loses us talent. Thinking about the person and what they want to do with their lives and giving them multiple options keeps them with you longer. Now, it's great if you have those options. If you don't have those options, plan for attrition. We never plan for attrition. We just let it rock our world. People need to plan to lose 20 to 30 percent of their SDRs annually. You plan, it's not a big deal. You don't plan, there goes your pipeline. Is there a difference between plan and accepting? I had a question on Hey Keenan. You guys aren't watching Hey Keenan, you're missing out. But anyways, I had a question on Hey Keenan, what's an acceptable level of churn? And I said there isn't an acceptable level of churn. You should plan on churn. And, but you should never accept churn. Do you agree with that? Well, you know, not that I want to disagree with my host. Disagree, but brilliant. yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have to. You have to accept churn. I mean, these people are getting recruited like crazy. If you don't have the learning environment in place for them, if you don't have the career path in place for them, yeah, you have to learn to accept. It's not always a negative. It's a business issue. We accept other business issues. We need to accept this one. I should say, but accept a certain level. Let me rephrase it, right? Because that, to me, a churn yeah. is a leadership issue, right? So if I say, oh, you know, 12% is an acceptable level, I'm not, I don't buy that. Why can't it be seven? Why can't it be six? Right? We're going to have a churn, but okay. All right, well, I have a sort of an interesting uh, perspective there. Um, you know, our company has grown so fast, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, what we do is we bring in good, good people but we teach them a methodology and we teach them a system and a playbook and and now all of a sudden every other uh, high-tech company in, in the valley here in uh, Silicon Slopes we call it man they're gunning after our people like I've never seen and uh, the same thing happens with our clients you know Groupon was up there in Chicago with 1500 reps using the technology and the infrastructure and um, a year later, we had 15 new clients all the way around Groupon. And we said, how did that happen? We weren't marketing in the Chicago. And what we found is the churn, <laughs> they picked off all the good reps. And the reps show up the first day and say, hey, well, I can't do this without inside sales. What mm -hmm. do we and we get a call that night. So the, the, the churn is, a, is, I think, a pretty good cross-pollination of, of training, of opportunity, the cultural playbook. Uh, of, of reps who get to work at a couple of different places who might have different skills training. They might some might be using Trish and, and they're going to kick butt, right, Trish? But, but you know, 
especially early on. I wrote an article in Forbes about five things business can learn from a tree. And, and the first thing a tree does is it sends roots out in many, many, many different directions. You know, until it finds something that it really likes. I love what Trish was saying. And, and that might be a couple different companies with their cultures and their, their skills methodologies. So churn looks bad from the corporate perspective, but, but when you look at the big picture, I think it actually contributes to a real healthy uh, regional economy, uh, to a healthy career path for the rep. I, I may be crazy, but but I'm looking at it a little differently. What do you guys think? Dude, that was like, that was like Buddha level shit. He's, I'm like, ooh, wow. So he's so so altruistic. I love uh, him. No. That's why he's the big bear. I mean, all I, I I just picture him sitting at the top of some giant mountain in Asia oh. and just <laughs> young, young grasshopper. Yeah. I mean, that was that was good. Oh. I, that was good. That was good. So you, that does that earns you because I want to tee you up. I know you want to do this, and I want to talk about it. The idea of of uh, personalities and. You talked a little bit about it before, the personalities in the role and the types of people in the roles in SDS. Talk about that in your in your yeah, pers I'm, pers I'm pers really excited about it. This has been a personal hobby of mine. I've, my degree is in psychology, believe it or not. It's a bachelor's degree. It's almost useless for anything. Well, I'm qualified to push a boom. <laughs> about <laughs> you know, you got to keep going. But, but my hobby was personality theory. And eight years ago, we started using a company and, um, and all of them have those four personality types. And I'm going to just show this here. This is basically the four types. You've got dominant, which is that red. You've got expressive for the purple, amiable, and analytical. Yeah, I'm amiable. <laughs> You've got a lot of amiable, yeah. But I don't hate to tell you. And, and here's the overall mix in population. Okay, so amiables and analyticals rule the overall population. Dominants are pretty few. Expressive. So the question then is, who who's really good in the sales world? Well, this is our company. This is instance of the company. Look at the expressives and the dominants. I mean, we're a sales culture. That's who we are. And then look at look at the map for closers, you guys. Holy crap! It's wow. almost evenly divided between dominants and expressives. And guess what? We we tested Trish and and Jim and. And you guys are expressive dominant. You got you got the two mojo going on, and Hello. both good talkers. So a little more expressive side. You know, got that big smile. But watch this. Look at this, guys. This is business development. This is SDR. They are far more expressive. Far more expressive. I love that. So yeah, the dominant is strong for the closers. The SDRs are really really good talkers. And watch the closest that they map onto is not the closers. It's actually the account managers. In fact, yes. our career path, Trish, about half our SDRs move into account management, farming, not hunting. And the other half would totally move into the closers. So it's a whole different world than I thought, but uh, very, very interesting. That is very, very. So, how do you. I'm sorry, Trisha, what are your thoughts on this? Jump in. Oh, I'm on his bus. I'm on Ken's bus. I mean, you know, it used to be people would tell me I was type A, high D. Still am, apparently. Maybe I've mellowed and went a little more expressive. But I think, you know, he's hit the nail on the head. Understanding before you hire or even post-hire where someone falls in that scheme is going to help you coach them more effectively. Yeah. Like, I would guess an expressive would be coach to it. So I think understanding that about someone, and I don't think you can just understand it by having a couple conversations, I think is a critical success factor. And, and don't get me wrong, some people who are amiable and analyticals kill it in sales. They kill it in sales because guess what? They understand that majority of the population better, but by and large it's the expressives and the dominance that migrate in that world of sales yeah. and BB. Yeah. So, do you, so, so, Ken, if if this is important and this is a piece of data, how do how do companies find out if they're expressive, dominant, amiable? How do they find out? Well, you know that, that eight years ago we started doing that in house with with this assessment, this personogenics assessment, and that's something we could make available if someone just want to try it. We'll let them try one or five and see see what they think. But it's pretty interesting. It helps with your spouse. It helps managing your team. 
Imagine a dominant trying to manage a team of amiables. They're opposites, and they better understand how to work together, and vice versa. How does the rep understand how to work for their manager? It's really, really helpful to know what personality type they are because you might be doing stuff just backwards and wondering why it ain't working. Got it. Try this out. Sorry. Hey, you guys. Before we lose Ken, uh, we do have an audience question from Mr. Jack Kosakowski. What percentage of your sales reps cold call leads? What percentage social sell? And what percentage other? Okay. So I have no idea. First of all, there's no such thing as cold calling anymore. It's the cold that's dead, not the calling. I'm so I'm boring myself by saying it, but it's so true. There's no such thing as cold calling. They might be referring to outbound. And then I'm not sure I understand why social selling would be broken out of the equation when social doesn't sell, people do, but social is a tool in the kit people use to prospect and sell. So I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question based on my questions about the question. What do you think, Ken? <laughs> No, I hear you. I, I understand, but I mean, let, let's take a stab at it. I, I think I think the answers, and I might need the question restated, but the answers that I've seen is it's based a lot on how much marketing your your company's good at. Yeah. And if you if your marketing is really really good and you've got leads, why in the world would you cold call? And again, with oh. Trish's point, cold calling is I'll dead. I'll tell you why. <laughs> Go ahead, Trish. Well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, and this is where Ken and I disagree. Marketing with marketing following up on leads, you end up with what you get. With outbound, you go after what you want. Outbound deals are bigger. Oh, I love ASP that. ASP is bigger. Oh my gosh, I love that. It's, it's, Say that again. Say that again. Outbound deals are bigger because you go after your ideal customer profile, the right guy. Oh, you, you, you can have a conversation. Inbound, you, you get what you Trish. get. We're, we spend so much time wasting time on inbound. It makes me insane. You know, uh, we'll chase I, I Joe jump. Loser <laughs> until the cows come up. You know, we we found that internet leads are seventy two percent small. And Trish is absolutely right. If you want to go get the big accounts, the ones that stay around, you got to go after them. But there is a, a new methodology that we really like called target account marketing that starts nurturing and educating those larger accounts that you really want. My favorite example is Aura Brush. You know, they, they have this little uh, thing that helps you brush your tongue and get rid of bad breath. I mean, it's sort of goofy, but, but they did a Facebook ad in Bentonville, Arkansas for 65 bucks, I think, to every employee of Walmart and said, your breath stinks, Walmart. You better get Aura Brush. And they got a call two days later saying, Uncle, oh, okay, we okay, you know. We'll carry Aura Brush, and now they're in every single Walmart in the country, you guys. It was so cool. But uh, overall, I, I agree with Trish. She's, she's got me. I cry uncle. She wins. Thank you. <laughs> Trish, you got to say Thank it to me. You. I freaking love it. I am going to use that 100 times over. If uh, Outbound, you get, you go out, you get what you want. Marketing, you get what you get. Is that how you said it? I said, no. With Inbound, you get... Now I forgot what I said. Something like inbound, you get what you get. Outbound, you go after who you want. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Which then leads. So, are you doing okay? Do we need to gracefully let you roll on, Ken? Or you still run, you guys? Thanks so much. Okay. I'm, I'm booked. Oh, back Ken, to nice back to you. It's always an honor being with you guys. Thanks again. Thanks, baby. It's a pleasure. And I know we still have some open business, Ken. So call me when you yeah, want to get wrapped up. You're the man. Talk to you soon. Peace, baby. So, so, so Trish. You know what? I want to go back to Jack's question because I don't think we answered it for, for him and he okay. was kind enough to submit it. So, will you repeat it? Yes. Okay, so the question was... Sorry. That's okay. So, it was essentially what percentage of your team does cold calling? What percentage yes. of your team does social selling? And what would you... Like the percentage that you would classify as maybe other. Okay, I think that was specifically meant for Ken since he said your team, not a team. 
So we'll get Ken to respond to Jack via email or something. Yeah. How's that? That sounds perfect. Yeah. You, you, answered. I do want to go to something that you triggered in my head, Trish, right? And I believe this so strongly. And so if I am wrong, I want you to beat me up. But if I'm not wrong, I want us to really drill this into the head of people. When it comes to inside sales or sales development, the level of reliability or reliance is a better word. The level of reliance on marketing is astronomical. And there isn't enough commitment and structure in the organization that puts the amount of accountability on marketing that is needed or commensurate with the amount of accountability there is for sales. Agree or disagree? So I think there's a shift in place. I do think it's beginning to shift. So, you know, we're focused on the B2B tech space and we do research on that very topic. So we know that marketing contributes about 42% to the pipeline with most companies unless you're SaaS and then it jumps up to 55%. Well, that leaves a heck of a lot of pipelines people have to find on their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a firm believer, go get what you want which means outbound. Inbound's awesome, but you also need to do the outbound. But I am seeing a shift in marketing now being measured and compensated on overall revenue and not just number of leads um, Kiki, that come into the pipeline. Kiki, can you find what we're talking? Can you find my Hey Keenan number five or four where someone asked about, oh, it's not up yet. I'll put it up soon. Someone, okay. asked, it on, someone asked it on Hey Keenan. How do you... Uh, get sales and marketing to work together and actually Trisha I said exactly that you want to get them working together you compensate them the same way so great point yeah it has great to be point. it has to be yeah. Yeah. yeah or make it the same make it you know what else I'm starting to see as a trend is it's the same person it's the same man or woman that strategically owns both functions now that's interesting that is interesting. I kind of like that. That is interesting. And so right. one of the, what, 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 how I stumbled across this and why I sort of like going here for a minute is I believe that there is a huge blind spot for sales or for the organization, not even for one function or the other, but for this organization. Because when we're talking about growth, when you start building SDRs, I found at least with my clients that they are doing a good job of building these, these lead generation engines, but they lose sight of the fact that the way they've structured it is their growth is intimately tied to the number of leads they bring in, but in their head they see it as tied to the number of reps they have, out the, the account executives or the outbound reps. What happens is they start hiring more of these people and all of a sudden start saying, wait, we're not growing. Well, they never really looked at the lead generation engine. And so they couldn't support the size of the sales team. Are you seeing that? Sort of. Let me see if I can re-articulate it back to you because I did write a post called you're looking at the wrong end of the donkey because whenever I hear companies say we're not growing, they always look at pipeline and they look at marketing and they look at SDRs. They never look at sales and say you guys suck. Like they never look at their sales process to figure out what's broken there. So I think if you're if you're a company and you're not getting the growth you want, I think maybe it's time we stop looking at the top of the funnel and started looking at who's doing what in the middle and in the closing stages. Because if you have bad process, bad reps, that's why you're not getting growth. You okay, need to so look I'm there say, and then worry about top. I'm going to say incremental growth because unless my sales team is the shittiest team on the planet, right? The amount of, if I go into the middle, which I agree, what we're talking about is incremental. Three, five, seven percent max, right? Close rate and percentage and improvements. But if yeah. I'm looking at the top of the funnel, that's massive growth. If I can learn, if I'm only, gener only if I'm generating a thousand leads a month and that supports, I'm making this up, but a quota of uh, $200,000 a month. So if I can get that 1,000 into 1,500, now I'm at 400,000 a month. That is substantial growth. I can't turn improved close rates and better salespeople into 20% return. So I, agree, I agree with you, but one is scaling, one isn't. So, and what I found is yeah. organizations miss that mark. They don't recognize the correlation between the growth in lead generation and how they create new campaigns and find new inbound leads and connect with new people and do things creative enough 
to grow that from 1,000 to 1,500. They don't do the math. So if I want to grow 35% top line, that means I need to grow X amount in the top of the funnel, and that means these many SDRs, and it means these many more campaigns, et cetera. Do you see that disconnect? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. But it's an investment. See, it, it's like a snake eating its tail. <laughs> to grow, you need to, you know what I mean? To grow, you got to invest. So it's like, if you're not growing, you're not making, and it is an investment. So everybody wants this quick ROI. What they have to be bellying up to is it's a longer ROI. Yes. It takes longer. You got to make the investment, and you got to eat the investment until you get that ROI. Love it. All right. And, so and you know what? Oh, no. More of bad does not equal growth. So you have to have the process, the tools, the systems. Everything needs to be working right to get that growth. Because automating suck gets you just more suck faster. Agreed. Completely agreed. Yeah. Yeah. What is that phrase about uh, not being profitable? I'll just make up for it by selling more. Something like that. <laughs> that old adage. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> All right. So um, before we go to cut it out, which you're going to love today, it's just for you, Trish. Um, uh, give. Is it food? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> give, give, what's your parting words? What is the little piece of wisdom that you would give an, uh, a, a VP of sales development? Oop. And um, you're frozen for me. You guys are frozen for me, so I'm sorry. You can dump me. <laughs>